Uh, all right, good. So as you know, there are four goals in life. According to Indian scripture, according to South Asian spirituality, there are four things that are deemed worthy of attaining in life. And they are karma, in, in this order, karma, firstly, pleasure, uh, any kind of sensual gratification, karma. Next, artha, which means wealth, or it could mean um, renown. So it could also mean being like a kind of established member of society who's built a very impressive business. But typically, artha means wealth or power. Wealth slash power, I guess you could say. Then dharma. Dharma means, literally it means law or religion, but it means, I guess you could say morality. Really in a classical antiquated sense, dharma means being known in your society as someone who performs their Vedic rituals correctly following the injunctions of the scriptures. I suspect that there's a truly social component to dharma in ancient Indian civilization. You know, uh, dharma meant you did your duties according to your station in life, your ashrama, and also according to your varna, your position in society. What it meant to do your dharma is to honor your ancestors, honor the gods, honor the animals, etc., etc., perform the right rituals at the right times, like the shraddha, funeral ceremony, all of that. If you did it, you were an upstanding good citizen. That's really what dharma means. And then higher than that is the ultimate goal of a human life, moksha. As Sri Ramakrishna says, the goal of life is God realization. That's what is meant by moksha, but it can be translated as salvation, enlightenment, uh, the achievement of fulfillment, or I prefer the word consummation. So it's the completion, the consummation of a human life well lived. Now, it seems like the Indian framework um, presented a kind of sequencing system or a model for how these goals were supposed to be pursued. It seems like in the four ashrama system of Manu, this is old text law of Manu, and it maps out a human's life in four stages. And it starts with your early brahmachari life where your main goal is to study. This is where you get thoroughly grounded and situated and oriented in Vedic thought. So you learn your law and your math and your most of all Sanskrit grammar and, 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 and spirituality. You learn to do the proper rituals. You learn your craft if you belong to a guild of tradesmen. You learn you know, how to rule a kingdom if you belong to the Kshatriya class. And you learn you know, how to perform Vedic rituals and chant mantras and meditate if you belong to any of these Kshatriya or Brahmin class. You learn all that stuff. That's for the first 20 something years of your life. So like 25 years of your life or something. Then at age 25, you become a householder. And at this point, it is actually your duty to be in the world and enjoy it. You're supposed to make wealth. It's as, as Swamiji once said, you know, Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda said, it's a sin for a householder not to make wealth. He never used to talk about sin. He wasn't really into that. But he seemed to say that the duty of the householder is to build up the nation, build up the wealth, have some savings, etc. So a householder was supposed, you know, married, had children and was supposed to provide for them. The duty of the householder was to make the money for the children. A wife is to be loving, husband is to be protective, like all that stuff. Traditional gender roles all in here. This is just the nuclear household of ancient India, right? So that's going on. You're doing your artha part of life and you're also interested in karma. You just got married. So now you can enjoy conjugal bliss and you're probably handed if you were from one of the higher castes, like any royal family or whatever, you were probably given the Kama Sutra. You know, those aphorisms on pleasure. So you were given a manual on how to enjoy yourself in bed and really just have a wonderful, pleasant life when it comes to sensual gratification. You're supposed to enjoy that and have that. It's a very interesting idea that, that this is not a demonized, moralized thing. It's, it's part of life and it's part of one's evolution as a soul making their way through life. They do have to enjoy pleasure. And then they enjoy wealth, the intoxication of making money. You know, they enjoy that and, and renown and prestige and just feeling like they've accomplished something. You know, a lot of householders in the world, the biggest sense of meaning for them is just to look back on their life and feel like they made a difference. They accomplished something. They built a business. They served some people. And above all, they put their kids through college. For many people, that's enough. And that's good, actually. That's part of the journey of a soul. Then if you've done all of that basic stuff, the next thing you're probably going to be interested in as a young householder, you know, with your family is dharma. You want to perform the right rituals, the right ceremonies. For what? Because it's insurance for the afterlife. So when you die in this life, you will be transported to various planes. And, and what plane you go to is directly in proportion to how well you perform your rituals. 
You know, so you wanted to make sure that you put some money in the bank by way of punya, by way of merit, and you want to do your rituals so that you would go to heaven. So primarily, the Vedic ritual system was meant to, first and foremost, grant earthly and heavenly reward. So it would be better if you performed a ritual for your money. That's a, the most important point I want to drive home today in today's lecture is that Vedic rituals are magical and spiritual means of acquiring, to a large extent, worldly stuff. You know, and in the Bhagavatam, one of that, the great Bhakti book of the Vaishnavas, it lists all the different gods that you can assuage in order to get certain things. You know, and so typically a Vedic practitioner, particularly a Brahmin, and if not a Brahmin, then, you know, a Kshatriya might hire a Brahmin to come to their house and do a ceremony. But whether you're a Brahmin or Kshatriya, or maybe even a Vaisha, typically a Vedic person would use magic. I mean, they would do a ritual and that ritual would bring into their life that thing that they most coveted. Why? So perhaps they could finish with it. So they could enjoy it and move on to the next stage. If someone still wants karma and they pretend to want moksha, they're going to be in spiritual life for the wrong reasons and they won't get either. They'll just wage war with themselves. It's better if a person who wanted karma was honest about that and then learned to get pleasure and then got it and consummated it and, and, and realize, oh, there's nothing to it really. And they don't have to live a whole life eating chocolate cake to realize this is never going to ultimately fulfill me, right? A little bit is enough, but they have to acquire what they think they need to be fulfilled. So you do the magic, I mean, you do the Vedic ritual and you get the, the outcome and you move on. So a person who's got to the Dharma stage of their life is doing the rituals, but also knows to use rituals for Artha and Kama as well. And most importantly, they want uh, heaven because the, the they've already worked out that no matter how much artha you have, it's not ultimately fulfilling. It's anxiety inducing and pleasure in the world is very transient, but don't worry. There's heavenly wealth and heavenly pleasure, which is the longest lasting orgasm you could ever imagine. So like that's worth having, right? Okay. So remember, this is the most important thing I want to drive home today that for most of Indian civilization, Vedic ritualism were for worldly shit and heavenly stuff, right? It was for enjoyment primarily. It was not for moksha. It's for worldly stuff. So we say the Vedas has two faces, two types of wisdoms, two types of vidyas. One is aparavidya, lower knowledge, and the other one is paravidya, higher knowledge. It's a very important concept to understand because today I'm going to tell you about tantra and anava upaya. You know, we're going to talk about anava upaya, but to understand anava upaya, which is the last thing we need to talk about in our list of four tantric categories of practice, I must first hearken back to the Vedas and explain this principle, which is, First, you have in the Vedas what is called the karma kanda, the portion on rituals, and that is predominantly an aparavidya. Not to say that it's bad. It's just imminent knowledge, knowledge about imminent things. And by imminent is also meant heavens, by the way. Heavens aren't yet the transcendental plane. They're still imminent. The, the, the term imminent includes all sorts of realms of subtle experience. So anyway, vidya, knowledge pertaining to the imminent reality is called aparavidya. But there was another kind of knowledge in the Vedas, and it's called Paravidya, the higher knowledge, the transcendental knowledge. And as a result, you get two types of schools of Indian philosophy, one of them concerned with ritualistic activity, and the other with this higher knowledge. The first is called Purva Mimamsa, and the second is called Uttara Mimamsa, also known as Vedanta. The second type of Indian, Indian practice is called Vedanta, and it's mostly Gnostic, philosophical, and contemplative. And it's interested not in Dharma, not in Artha, not in Kama, but in Moksha, the final consummation of a human life. But it presupposes that you have by now sussed that out for yourself that you've gone through the whole range of karma, artha, dharma, if not in this life, then in a previous life. But at some point, you had to have tasted the chocolate cake and asked for something more. You know, so that is called the paravidya. So if you read like Vedantic texts, particularly non-dual Vedantic texts, you'll see a lot of karma kanda bashing, or at least what looks like karma kanda bashing. You know, like for instance, in the Bhagavad Gita, they make fun of rituals. In many places, right? They're like, what will you achieve by mere ritualism? Stuff like that. Uh, know me alone to be the, the whole ritual, the performer, the offering, all that. And then in, in Shankara, after, more than anything, you hear this kind of karma bashing. You can't do good works to get into heaven. Who wants heaven anyway, right? So Amiji said, I've come not to teach you to go to heaven. I've come to teach you to stop wanting to go to heaven. And of course, we can have a long conversation as to why heaven is not valuable. In short, it's because anything that starts will end. 
So even if it's a longer lasting pleasure, it still has an expiration date. And many people who have enjoyed heaven come back and now want something more than heaven, which is moksha. You know? Okay, so um, you'll see a lot of bashing, like Shankaracharya saying, jnana alone will free you, not karma. Karma is not the opposite of ignorance. Jnana is, as we described last night. And so you get this sense, and this is the danger, you get this sense that it's wrong to want karma, artha, and dharma, and it's right to want moksha. This is the biggest danger in your spiritual life. This will cause like this weird schizophrenic kind of sense of waging war with oneself for natural proclivities and inclinations that need to kind of be fulfilled to some degree before a person can genuinely take up spiritual life. Like true renunciation must be uh, perhaps after a person has felt this, okay, I, I'm done with the world. My play is done. You know, but I, there are too many people who skirt that who are perhaps afraid of going out and being victorious in the world. You know, what happens is they're bashed this way and that by the world, can't get a girlfriend, can't make any money, can't pay their rent, become monks. Hare, they will be horrible monks unless they are ready to conquer kingdoms and master the material world. They have no place in spiritual life, honestly. And people who are very young who come to spiritual life are Maharajas and Maharanis in previous lives. They have that kind of triumphant spirit that ability to conquer the world, they just apply it to a much difficult, more difficult conquest, the inner realm. So today I wanna to talk about the Anava Upaya. And to do that, I have to stress that Tantra is actually interested in both goals. That's why it gets kind of a bad rep because people are like, oh, Tantra is hedonism. Kama Sutra is not a Tantra. Tantra, all Tantras, the text called Tantras are Moksha Shastras, meaning they're interested in Moksha, but they're holistic in that they also recognize the place of those other goals in life too, like Kama, like Artha, like Dharma. So let me go with Ram Kanta. Ram Kanta is one of the earliest Indian scholars in our tradition. And Ram Kanta gives us a definition for Tantra is one of the first people to do so. I mean, it's such a heterodox school with so many different texts with different theologies and metaphysics that Tantra is not any one thing, right? It's, it's kind of hard to say this is what Tantra is. It's a, you can't even call it a movement. It's not even like that cohesive and unified, you know? Um, it's several movements all under the umbrella of medieval Indian Shaivism, you know? Okay, but Ram Kanta, a scholar and a practitioner, tries. And he says this is what a Tantra is. A Tantra is any text Remember, Tantra is a text. Beyond anything, Tantra is a text. Is any text that teaches the aspirant how to achieve bhoga and yoga, worldly enjoyment and spiritual liberation. A text that teaches just yoga can be called a Tantra, but a text that teaches just bhoga cannot be called a Tantra. That's why the Kama Sutra is not a Tantra because it only teaches bhoga. But a Tantra might teach Boga, but also teach yoga. So in one text, you get means for the consummation of a human life at every stage of the journey. I think that's kind of exciting, right? So um, we talked last week and two weeks ago, I think three weeks ago, we might've taken up the discussion of the four types of practice in Tantra. Now today is a practice class, but um, now that we're taking our journey into Tantra, before we practice, it's very important that you not only understand the goals of practice, but like the methodology of practice. Otherwise, you'll just hack around in the jungle with no map, practicing meditation for like 16 hours a day. For what? You know, you won't, you won't even know it when you have it, if you don't know what it is you're looking for. <laughs> so we, we do a lot of talking because now is not really practice time. You can do that on your own, right? You can, you can sit and practice on your own. Now we're together, we might as well talk a little bit about the framework and the parameters of practice. That's why I'm investing this time a little bit to discuss this, uh, this schema. So we said there are four types of practice, broadly speaking. First is the anupaya. Upaya, upaya means practice or means or technique. Each upaya is a way to get attainment, to, to be liberated for enlightenment, for the consummation of a human life. Each of them work. As Swami Ji said, right, every soul is potentially divine. The goal is to make that divinity manifest. Do this by philosophy, by um, psychic control, by love, or by, by work. Do it by any one of these, any one more or all of these, and be free. That is the whole of religion. Books, doctrines, churches are but secondary details. How elegant, right? He's basically saying this, there are four ways to do it. Each one is sufficient, but you can combine them. And of course, he's talking about the four yogas. 
right? Jnana yoga, philosophy, do it by philosophy. Raja yoga, do it by psychic control. Uh, Bhakti yoga, do it by love. Or karma yoga, do it by work. So you see the Ramakrishna mission, Swamiji, Shankara, because you know Shankara talks about the four yogas. They're using these the same model, but for them, it's four yogas. For us in the Tantra tradition, it's the four upayas. And there are four ways, even the four yogas can fit into the four upayas. You know, so the first one is Anupaya. Anupaya, as you know, look at all the, the sandalwood. The Anupaya is um, no upaya. Anupaya is the wayless way. It, it's, it's direct, spontaneous awakening. All one has to say, a guru just has to look at you and say, Tattvamasi. I'm done. That thou art. You are awareness. You're not the body. You're not the mind. You're spirit. Finished. Just like that. Once you hear it once, that causes a sudden recognition, a trigger. It triggers a recognition and you immediately, oh my God, I was always free. I, I'm free now. I always will be free. I was never bound except because I made it up. <laughs> all my bondage, all my problems, I made it up. It's in the mind. I am not my mind. And therefore, I have nothing to do with any of the problems that I thought I had. I don't even need to get free. I'm already free. <laughs> That's what can happen, right? Like Anupaya is a spontaneous, sudden awakening. And there are nine types of this kind of sudden awakening as we discussed yesterday. So we won't go into today. Last night, we talked about the nine types of Shakti Pata. So that lecture is there. But anyway, if you get this, anything from the second type down to the ninth type, barring the first type, you're probably going to want to seek out the other three upaya. So the, the, the next upaya in, in this level of in decreasing subtlety is the Shambhava upaya. And in our lecture, how to meditate like Lord Shiva, we talked about that. This is the way of Shiva, the way of using everyday mundane occurrences as spontaneous triggers to recognizing your nature as pure awareness. So this is like looking at a patch of sunlight on the floor and realizing, oh my God, what I'm seeing is Shiva manifesting himself through me as a patch of sunlight like that. So that's Shambhava Upaya. Then last week, we had a long talk about Shaktopaya, the practice of philosophical inquiry, which in this tradition is lauded as one of the best parts, which is to purify the intellect, consider a philosophical framework, work with the idea, and then that idea will flower into a spontaneous awakening. That's the Shaktupaya. So these three, uh, to us, Tantrikas, these three are the main things, the main three, you know, and, and, and they're very direct. Anupaya, Guru immediately awakens you. Shambhava Upaya, Shiva awakens you when you like look at a chair or something. Shaktupaya, Shakti awakens you when you use thinking and thoughts and, and philosophy. But let's say none of these work. Let's say we haven't been spontaneously liberated. Let's say a patch of sunlight on the floor doesn't immediately reveal my Shiva nature to me. Let's say I don't understand these philosophies or even if I do, I'm not seeing any meaningful change in my experience. Beyond being a charming dinner party guest who knows a few extra Sanskrit words, I'm not seeing actually any change. So if that's the case, what do we need? Anava Upaya. There was the way of Shiva. There was the way of Shakti. Now there is the way of the individual. And everything you consider yogic practice fits into this category. All the mantras, all the pranayamas, the breathing techniques, all the postural yoga practices, all types of visualization techniques, every kind of meditation you can think of. If it's an active meditation where you're sitting and visualizing like the sun and the moon, all of that fits under this very broad category called Anava Upaya. And uh, if I were to ask just for fun, Kat, what do you think the primary Anava Upaya is in this tradition? Like the main practice in Tantra. When I say Tantra, you say? Puja. <laughs> exactly. The main Anava Upaya is Puja, ritual worship, which is what we do with the candles and the, the lights and the flowers and all that. Now, in the science and art of ritual worship, many mudras were invented, bells and smells, Kat says. So many mudras were invented, meaning hand gestures. So when I want to meditate on my deity, I will do kurma mudra tortoise pose. Why? Because this hand gesture evokes the image of a tortoise withdrawing its limbs back into its shell. So if I want to visualize, like say, Ma Kali, I need to go deep within to the very essence of my being, awareness itself. Who is Ma Kali? So what I'll have to do is take the flower that I'm going to give to Kali, put it in my hand, and using this mudra as a suggestive device, I plunge my mind deep within and do a mental worship of Kali. Then that same flower, I take it, and I put it at Kalima's feet and I say, please come, please sit, please accept my worship. And then I transition into an external worship. Even then I have mudras. 
I give flowers with a particular mudra. Earlier on, I have to use Denu mudra to nectarize the water. There's Matsya mudra to nectarize. Like there's so many hand gestures. And not only that, there are positions of the body that I might feel spontaneously inclined to do. There are mantras that I say that have been developed for the puja. So mantra, the chanting of sacred formulas, mudra, the holding of certain hand gestures, bhavana, certain creative visualizations like visualizing the kundalini shakti and all that. All of this is what make up the anava upaya of tantra. That this is really the, the, the main point today is that everything you consider practice is anava upaya. And all of it is the ride, sorry, the line to get into the line to get onto the ride in Disneyland. You know, be careful. You can practice spirituality all you want and it will only do marginal good without this roadmap in our opinion. You know, it is the firm view of the tantric tradition and the Buddhist tradition that if you don't have a view, a, a samyak drishya, a right view and a right roadmap of what you're doing and why you're doing it, it's going to be kind of a lot of wasted time and a lot of like dead ends and stuff. So we ask, why do we do anava upaya? Why do I do puja? Why do I meditate? Why do I repeat a mantra? Um, why do I put my body in certain positions? What's any of this for? And the answer is almost always to purify the mind, chitta shuddhi, removing any malas, impurities, and to focus the mind removing any vikshepa or distraction. Once I get rid of my, my impurities and my distractions, then and only then can I profit from Shaktupaya, a true contemplation of philosophical ideas. And that will prepare me further, will purify my mind yet further for the subtlety of Shambhava Upaya, which when cultivated over a long period of time will ultimately cultivate in this life or next in Anava Upaya. Oh, sorry, Anupaya the spontaneous liberation and an abiding realization. So see, it's a graded approach. You do your puja and your meditations, anava upaya, in order to do the philosophy. You do the philosophy in order to be able to appreciate pure presence. And if you cultivate that long enough, you will be a fully awakened being, a jivan mukta in our tradition. So that's the map. And I think it's all been spelt out kind of nicely. The one last point I want to make before I leave you to practice is uh, this. In anava upaya, primarily in puja, there's things that you can do for money. There's things that you can do for health and material well-being. Um, and there's things that you can do for pleasure. I just have to be honest about that and upfront that the tantric tradition provides you magical means for attaining worldly ends if you should so desire. In fact, that you should so desire is not a problem at all. It's encouraged. Last night, we talked about why, right? The metaphysics of Tantra is this world. You know, in some traditions, you say this world is a bridge. It's a debased place. It's a bridge. Cross it quickly. Tantra says the same. Cross it, transcend it. But it's not a bridge. It's not a trap. It's kindergarten, but it's play. This world is play. It's like a Montessori for children. You're supposed to have fun here. Kali specifically congealed this world and entered into it as every plant, animal, and person to play, right? So it's kind of weird that you would deny her her play of pleasure, wealth, and, and ritual if that's what she wanted at that stage in your life. And so she's provided us with these tools for those things. So I'm going to give you a few mantras, not initiation. I'm just like suggesting a few mantras that um, do worldly stuff. Um, and they're not necessarily... Uh, Okay, let me just give you one and show you show you why it's it's a tantric mantra. So here's one, right? It's called the Maha Mrittunjaya Mantra. Many of you know it. Um, Om Triyambakam Yaja Mahe Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam Urva 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 Rukka Bandhanan Mrit Yor Om Dhyamagam Yajamagahe Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam Urva Arukam Vibhandam Mit Mukshiyam I'm typing it now, I've forgotten it. Om Dhyamagam Yajamahe Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam Urva Arukam Vibhandhanan Mrityor Mukshi Yamam Ritahat Right, okay, so this mantra, um, it's called the Maha Mrittun Jaya Mantra. And you can, of course, just like Google it. Maha Mrittun Jaya Mantra. So it's a very important mantra to demonstrate what it is we're talking about today. So it is a tantric mantra in the truest sense, although it comes from 
an Upanishad. And, and, and that's the thing. A lot of people think Tantric is non-Vedic, but no, no, a lot of our mantras are Upanishadic mantras. A lot of them come from the Taittiriya Upanishad. This one is like old, like a Rig Veda mantra, right? It's an old, old mantra and it's associated to Shiva. That's the first thing that makes it a Tantric mantra. Tantra, as you know, is a tradition that emerged within Shaivism. So already, because this mantra is associated to Shiva, already it's got a Tantric flavor. Secondly, the reason it's Tantric is because it has a worldly and a spiritual benefit. So if you get Swami Shivananda's Japa Yoga, for instance, this incredible book on the recitation of mantra by one of the greatest Himalayan masters to have ever lived, in Japa Yoga, he opens with this instruction, do the Triambagam, do Mahamritunjaya, like some 10,000 times on your birthday or something like that. And he says, if you do it, you'll get great health. And I was told by some masters to do it when I sit in a cave. So when I, when I find a cave like, and I want to meditate in it, they told me to do that mantra because it protects against scorpions, centipedes, and spiders. Oh, by the way, those of you who are interested in running to the Himalayas, there are big centipedes there. You should be warned. You know, they're all over the place. You can get, you don't even have to stay in a cave. You can, yeah, there you go. There are centipedes, okay? Watch out. They're very scary, but they bite. The spider, the scorpion, the centipede, it can bite, you know? And yogis do die sometimes, uh, but they say yogis never get bitten. True yogis never get bitten. Maybe one of the secrets is they have mantras that protect them from such things. So like, like you go into the cave, you sit there and maybe before you, and, and you do your practice, your formal practice, you do this like 10,000 times. Om Triambagam Yajamahe Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam Urva Rukameva Bandhan Mithyo Mukshiyam Amrita You just do that with your Japa Mala maybe or with your hands like so many times and it gives you a worldly material benefit. Typically, it's for protection. It's a protection mantra. So I think it's in some traditions, this is called an apotropaic. Have you heard that word apotropaic? It's an anthropological term to describe like charms or spells that protect you, right? So this mantra is a powerful apotrop apotropaic. Yes, it's powerful because it gives you good health. Um, it protects you against snakes, spiders, scorpions. It um, gives you protection on journeys. If you're making a long journey, like sometimes there can be landslides in the Himalayas. So you chant this mantra. Wonderful, right? Wonderful mantra to chant. But also the meaning of the mantra is, oh, three-eyed Lord of wisdom, Shiva, pluck me from my bondage as you would deftly pluck a cucumber from its stem. So I might cleave to eternal life. I mean, the meaning of the mantra is spiritual, but the mantra is more than its meaning. It's its sonic vibration as we were describing last week a bit. So just the, the sound of the mantra, using those beads, those seed syllables, the kind of phonemes that the mantra involves does both that which the mantra linguistically promises and it gives you the material benefits that it was, it was talking about. So it's, I think, a tantric mantra in the truest sense of the word because it gives you boga and yoga and it's associated to Shiva. So that's one mantra for you, the Maha Mrityunjaya mantra. Another suggestion is, oh, thank you, Chandraji. Another suggestion is to do puja to Lakshmi Ma for money. That's another thing. The idea is, here's Lakshmi Ma. I need some money. I'm going to take the mantra, Om Shri Maha Lakshmiye Devye Namaha. So I'll put it here. Her Bij mantra is this. Maha, uh, Shri is a Bij mantra. Lakshmiye Devye Namaha. Now, of course, if you really want this to be effective, you should go to a guru and get initiated into that mantra. You know, if you want that, like maybe a guru, remember, we are predominantly initiatory tradition. So you might go get initiated into that mantra. Shreem, right? You'll get that mantra. And then you do the ritual. You might just chant that mantra or you might do a whole puja to Lakshmi and that will bring wealth into your life. And that's good because that will set you up for spiritual life. Maybe the wealth, you'll, you know, you'll get over it or you'll use it to build an altar or something. So that's another mantra for you. Okay, and then there's more. What about um, the various Gayatri mantras that we have? So for instance, the Shiva Gayatri mantra or the Kali Gayatri mantra, those to me are for liberation par excellence, but they also give worldly protection. And you can say you want um, like, learning. You're starting a new class, right? And you want to learn well. So you might go in front of your Saraswati, do a little puja for her. And you might say something like, um, Ong, Ong, um, Ong Vak Devye Vidmahe Virinji Patinye Cha Dimahi Tanno Vani Prachodayahat. That's the uh, Saraswati Gayatri Mantra. So you use that mantra and the Gayatri Mantras, we'll talk a little more about them next week, but the Gayatri Mantras all bring 
into the mind the illumination from that divinity. So if Saraswati is the Athena of our pantheon, then she is the aspect of divinity in charge of learning. So it makes sense before you start a new class to use that mantra and call that force into your life so learning goes well. So that's a Saraswati mantra. Then there's a Lakshmi mantra, that Gayatri mantra. And my favorite ones are, of course, the Shiv mantras. Om Tat Purushaya Vidmahe, Mahadevaya Dimahi, Tanno Rudra Prachodayat. Kali mantra, Om um, Kriyin Kalika Echa Vidmahe, Smashana Vasinye Cha Dimahi, Tanno Gaurie or Agora Prachodayat. These you can go Google, you know, you can find them on the internet. Kali Gayatri, Shiva Gayatri mantra, Lakshmi Gayatri mantra. Today we're not going to go into the mantras. I just want to sketch out for you the kind of approach and anavarpaya. So we'll close here. I'm going to invite you now to consider using the rest of this time in your own space on your own to explore a mantra. And, and my, my experiment is this. You can go on the internet and find a mantra, a Gayatri mantra of any deity that particularly appeals to you. Then for the rest of this time, learn the mantra, memorize it by heart, and then chant it. Either chant it aloud or better yet, upamshu, whisper it, or even better, mentally recite it, right? So do this mental recitation of the mantra over and over and over and over and over again. If you have a japa mala, do 10 rounds of, 10 rounds of that japa mala, at least, okay? You have to do it a lot. For this to work, you have to do the mantra a lot. Maybe the puja can work if you do it just once, but typically a mantra, you got to do it a lot. If not all through the day, at least for a, a good lead chunk, okay? So take any mantra. Gayatri Mantra, the regular Gayatri Mantra, or Shiva Gayatri Mantra, um, Lakshmi Gayatri, whatever you want. And then for the rest of this time, and you probably will finish 10 rounds by the end of the class, honestly, if you just kind of know the mantra, you do it. Now my game today is next week, let's talk about if the chanting of the mantra altered your reality in such a way that the presence of that deity was made more manifest. So maybe if you're chanting a Shiva Mantra, you might see more homeless people or you might like notice more cremation grounds or that vibe will come. Or if you're doing a Lakshmi mantra, maybe you'll get a check. I don't know. Or maybe you'll feel more beautiful or someone will compliment you in your dress or something. So right now, my game is to invite you to connect to a particular aspect of divinity using the mantra. You don't even have to visualize anything, but for best results, typically we visualize the artistic and poetic depiction of that deity, which is typically something revealed in, in trance-like visions. Yeah. So um, that's the game. That's one thing that you might do. Okay, one game is you can chant the Gayatri Mantra. Another game is if you have an altar in your house, you might go and do a five item worship, meaning in, uh, flower, some, flower uh, some perfume, flower on the perfume, then flower and sandalwood paste if you have it, uh, incense, fire, and food. So you might do a simple food and drink. You might go and do a simple five item worship in your own way and just kind of connect to that divinity. That's the second game. The third game is if you know some pranayamas or hatha yoga, you might do that. You might enjoy doing that. And the fourth game is to do some shaktupaya, some shambhava upaya, or you know, any other practices that we've learned in previous classes. Now, the, the idea in anava upaya is it's about you. It's your individual personal time. Anava means individual. So it's, it, it's kind of difficult to do in a group setting where every individual here uh, is uh, attracted to a different aspect of divinity, to a formless or to form, to a different presentation of divinity. Uh, each one of us here has a different need. Some of you might want some money. Some of you might want some learning. Some of you want to go to Moksha direct. You know, whatever each of you want, I want to restore now your autonomy to use the mantras and these practices for their, their, their intended effect, which is to gain both boga and yoga ultimately to transcend both and become Shiva. That is the Anava Upaya of Tantra. So I'll leave you to it. I'm going to chant the Shiva Gayatri Mantra and the Kali Gayatri Mantra, my father and mother. And then I'll leave you to your practice. And I really enjoyed this chat, everyone. Thank you for coming and, and, and having this time with me. All right, brother, sister, siblings, enjoy your practice. And let's close. Om Tat Purushaya Vidmahe Mahadevaya Dimahi Tanno Rudra Prachodayahat Om Kring Kalika Echa Vidmahe Smashana Vasinyecha Dimahi Tanno Kali Prachodayahat Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu
Om Peace, Peace, Peace.